Look at everyone entering into the room. This is so exciting. <laughs> I love it. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Come on in. Happy afternoon. Yeah, the sun's shining where I am. Yeah. <laughs> The sun's yeah. actually, I wasn't expecting it today. But yeah, I wasn't expecting it either. It's beautiful. It's not snowing up here in Minnesota. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to ask you, Jim, what it was like there, but I... it's actually in the 90s. It's... Ah, wow. wow. Not quite Florida, Texas hot or even close, but right. it's warm. All right. So I see that the number of people uh, jumping on, it's slowing down a little bit. So I want to go ahead and be mindful of our time as people continue to enter into the room. Hey, look, you guys, this is amazing. You have no idea how excited we were to just blow past the limit on our, our Zoom webinar and to receive over 100 people who signed up. I'm so excited for this session today. Uh, welcome to today's webinar on how to decide what to cut, keep, create, and grow, where we're exploring how to strategically position your portfolio of programming for greater member value. I'm Kiki Latalien, Senior Consultant for Tecker International, and I am here today to MC today's session and moderate your questions with my colleagues at TI, Carolyn Lugbill, Jim Meffer, and Paul Meyer. Now, while many of you may have made it through some of the initial tough decisions in recent months, putting out fires like whether or not to postpone or cancel or transition your meetings to virtual conferences, there are many, many other decisions that we all know that are lingering for those of us in the association and nonprofit community. Now, Carolyn, Jim, and Paul are going to take you through a step-by-step -step approach to conducting program assessments. The chat is disabled, but please ask your questions in the Q&A, and we'll try to answer them during today's session as we're going along. If we don't get to some of these questions, then I promise you we're going to respond to those individually. And with that, I would like to let you know that today's session is being recorded and you will receive an email with a link to the replay. So take it away, Paul. All right, thanks Kiki. And thank you all for joining us. And we know, everybody knows this is a difficult time for everyone. And we also know that many associations have had to make very, very difficult decisions around programs and services you know, for 2020. And now they're starting to think about 2021. And we realize that um, this process that we've been using for several years uh, called strategic program assessment and um, was a good tool if adapted to use during this time. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna share with you um, a, an adapted program that we've put together that we feel like is, is a really useful tool to help you now make the second phase or the second step of the decisions you need to make about your programs and services. We made the first steps, which are really critical ones for their current program portfolio of stuff coming up, say in the next three to four or six months. But now the real question on the table is, where do we go from here? How do we make a decisions? And as we know, programs and services can be very political decisions for associations. How do we make those decisions in a more objective way rather than a subjective way so that we're making the decisions for the right reasons going forward. So we're gonna introduce you to a, a process that we call strategic program assessment. This uh, particular tool that you'll see uh, was adapted from some work by a guy named Dr. Ian McMillan who started, who did this a while back. Uh, it's very much a public process, although you'll see how much we've changed it to make it more targeted and customized to the association world and what you're going through today, but it was originally created by Dr. Ian McMillan. And one of, we, and one of the challenges we know about associations is that we have this sort of weird business model. And you know, we've got this area where all of our revenue comes from, membership dues, meetings, et cetera, but it's actually spent someplace else. And then there's some decision-making process in the middle to say, here's our bucket of money, and potentially here's our programs and services, and that doesn't always match up. And we know today it doesn't match up even more because of the challenges we've been going through. So this is a, again, a process to help you to create better, better alignment to where your money is coming from and where your money needs to be spent 
in order to create greater value uh, for your members. The uh, uh, program is based on four important assumptions. First off, that we know that there are more opportunities than available resources. You know, I used to do some work in innovation training with for-profit companies and not-for-profit associations. And I was always amazed at how innovative associations were versus my for-profit clients, because associations could easily say, well, let's just have membership dues pay for that. Whereas in the for-profit world, what's the one thing that you're looking at or criteria for whether you do something or not, and it's how much money is it gonna make? So we find that it's really easy to brainstorm lots of good ideas, but the real question for associations is how do we take all those good ideas and how do we take all those programs and really create a, a focused portfolio that really creates greater value for not only the organization, but also for the membership. We all also know that we have scarce resources, that we are in a time right now, a critical, critical time where we have to make hard decisions. We also know that associations, when we think about the future, we shouldn't just think about how we can compete with everyone else. But the real question on the table is here, what do we do uniquely that others can't do? And how do we ensure that we're doing that as effectively as possible to A, bring value to our members and revenue to organizations? And we also know that creating just a whole bundle of stuff is not as good as creating a very focused set of very um, uh, strategic programs and services that we offer. So those are the four assumptions that we're basing this program on. And now my uh, colleague, Carolyn, is gonna help you kind of go through some of the first steps of how to put this program together. Carolyn? Actually, I think Jim has the next uh, steps. Um, Jim, why don't you? <laughs> oh yeah, certainly. Thank you, uh, Carolyn. Ah, Thank okay. you, Paul. Yeah, no worries. Um, we're going to outline today uh, six steps to the process that Paul talked about. There are uh, some pre-work that needs to be done in order to get the information that's necessary, build that foundation of knowledge that we so often talk about that help us make those objective decisions about what to do with the future of programs. And then we'll talk about the interactive session, whether it's virtual or face-to-face, -face, the actual assessment of the programs, thinking about what that future looks like for those programs. And then we'll talk about the final steps, the, the report, the follow-up, the way to evaluate what we've done and how things might be different in the future and what kind of progress we've made in the past or have, have, have made on the, the programs as we've identified their, their future. So we'll go through these uh, quickly and hopefully you'll have questions about these and comments and observations. We'll try to throw in some of our observations from doing this also with organizations. Um, Jim, I just want to jump in here real quick and say yeah. that, you know, what we've done with this too, which is really important for today, is really put together a process that could actually be done virtually. Um, I've had the privilege of working with a couple of groups already on turning this into a virtual program, not just a face-to-face. -face. So it does require interaction, but yet we've put it together so that it can obviously be done virtually as well. Yeah, and, and thank you, Paul. As, as some of you who have done this um, before recognize also, some of the things we've already done virtually, some of the background and some of the, the uh, material that's been put together. And so it, this is a, a hybrid version based on the reality that we're, we're facing right now. This process, as Paul talked about, really does uh, create an objective framework to assess programs in, in two dimensions. The first is that attractiveness, whether the program is attractive to the organization, to the members, whether it helps us achieve our strategic direction. Everything, again, is connected to that strategic plan, that direction that we're going, that vision, that mission for the organization to make sure that we're reinforcing and supporting where we're going as an organization. And the second is, our, uh, is the competitive position, as Paul mentioned. It's our ability, ability to actually execute, to use our resources effectively, to, to not compete where we don't have to, or to partner with other organizations where it makes sense. Um, but really to, again, to take this objective framework and apply it to the programs and services that we're providing to our members. It's so important that, uh, that we do take that objective look. And it's hard sometimes, being a, a past executive director, uh, of an association. I know when we were taking a hard look at programs, the instinct was to look at the, the staff and to think about the volunteers who actually developed the program who, who are, who are committed to it 
And sometimes that doesn't allow you that space to really think objectively about how this is trying to meet the needs of our members or what are we trying to accomplish here that is different than what others are doing. And so this process is really designed to, to, force, to force us to think that way. And sometimes you need that outside voice in the room too, which, which uh, we often have to, have to be the, uh, that outside voice that forces people to think differently and, and to, to not, not just say everything's okay, but, but to realize that things maybe need, uh, need to be different in the future. Yeah, and Jim, so that first step. Let me just jump in there too with, with yeah. just the reason why this program uh, assessment process was even created. One of the reasons is Jim just definitely pointed out is we know that we're in a challenging environment where many of our programs and services are there because some committee came up with it and we're stuck with it. And we don't know how to get rid of it because there's this sort of personal, professional sort of a lot, um, uh, ownership of the program that, that becomes so significant. So this process is giving you an objective way to kind of cut through those politics. Now, it doesn't solve all the political problems we may have with these programs, but it, it helps you cut through those politics and give you an objective view of, of the program itself. It also uh, allows us to take a comprehensive look at all of the programs that, that an association may be providing so that you see not just where there's external overlap, but where there may be internal overlap. One of the results that we could talk about later um, often is the combining of programs, the consolidation of things that are happening um, to make sure that we're not just adding new things, but we're looking really at how we can most efficiently and effectively utilize the resources and serve our members. The first step in the process is to really identify those programs to assess. And as I just mentioned, um, I find, and I think we all find, that looking at the comprehensive portfolio of programs, that term program is used universally, but looking at all the programs, all of the activities or services that you provide to your members is a really important part of this process. Um, so that you're looking at, you have an objective measure for all programs, but you're also looking at your for, full portfolio of programs to make sure you're, you're comparing them and you're seeing where there could be consolidation, where there might be things that you could do differently in the future. So here's a, uh, some considerations that are important to identifying the programs to assess. As I said, their, their business lines, their activities, their services that you're providing to your members, uh, that comprehensive look is important. And also, uh, time is definitely a consideration when we think about how many programs we want to assess. It takes generally for that, that, that third step uh, when we do the assessment, it takes about 20 minutes per program on average to review each of them. And so uh, we know that uh, there's a prioritization that may need to happen about the staging of programs that you look at also. I know that I often have groups think about those things that uh, and, and go through the, the, the process of prioritization and think about which, the, which of those programs require the most attention right away so that we can um, utilize our, our volunteer and staff members' time most effectively in this, in this process. And Carolyn, yes. let's talk about step two. All right, step two. So now that oh, you've identified... Kiki, did yeah, Sorry? you know, I, I was trying to figure out the best time to ask this question, but you know what, I'll go ahead and ask it right now. And that is how granular do you recommend going in your assessment? I feel like that's a question that may be better asked a little bit later on, but um, unless somebody wants to address it now, but, but uh, any thoughts on, on commenting or do you want to hold on to that one? Yeah, I, let me comment, make a couple comments. One is that okay. um, it, you know, we find that, you know, sometimes it's really easy to say, let's only pick up three programs and, and put it through this assessment because these are the three programs that are most vulnerable or whatever. But I find that um, by doing a sort of a more comprehensive look at it is a lot more honest because you're not then pitting one program over another. You're, you're looking at the entire portfolio as how it creates value. Now, the interesting uh, challenge that we all have here is how do you define a program, which is really what the question is. And it really is up to you. I've done assessments. For example, one group came to me and said, as part of our portfolio, we want to assess a, a reception, a president's reception at our conference. And I'm like, is that really a program? But they were spending so much money on it. And they really wanted to see if they're actually getting the value from that program or how they could do it differently to get greater value, even though it's just a reception. 
I also had a group one time assess their website. And you're thinking, website? How would we ever think about divesting of a website? We're never going to get rid of it. But it was really great to put their website through this process because in the end, it actually came into the cell of divestment, which you'll see later on. And you're like, you can't divest of it. But it gave them a really good sense of our website really is bad. And we've got to start over to redesign it as opposed to just tweak around the edges. So you can, you know, one of the things you do have to decide is what truly is defined as a program, but we want to keep that definition as loose as possible. So you really kind of get a sense of it could be an activity, it could be a whole business line, or it could be what we would traditionally call a program like an education program, conference, et cetera. I have yeah. one more question, and, and that is, is that, I mean, because so much is on the line right now where people are really having to get creative with their thinking about their budget and planning ahead, um, it, this is going to be a, probably a little bit more difficult now than it has been in previous years to do a thing like this. I mean, that's why we're talking about this today. So, um, you know, when you have to keep in mind that it might take 20 minutes per program to review each one as you're going through, but you also don't want to have too few programs that you're assessing, how can you figure out if you're, if you're getting that, that happy medium in there? I mean, what's too many or too little, too few? Well, that's nah, a good question that you guys can jump in here, but I've done as little as four and I've done as, as many as 125. Wow. So depending on the size of the association, depending on the, 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 the impact of these programs on the organization, you know, you, you, you certainly don't want to assess programs that have low impact on the organization. You know, for example, an awards program. That's always an interesting one. I mean, awards programs. Okay, we could all say, eh, are they really valuable or not? They don't bring in any money. Nobody cares that much about them except the winner and everybody else sitting at the table. But so an awards program, you could say, okay, let's put it through there. But really, it doesn't have much impact. So let's take our sort of high impact programs, either ones that are high impact in terms of value or high impact in terms of revenue and kind of put it through it. And also let's take those programs that we think, you know, are not doing what we think they should do. You know, in other words, their financial strategy is, is, is not being met by what, they're, what, by what the program is going is actually generating and figure out what we need to do differently. So, you know, if you have limited time, I do recommend that you take those programs that potentially have the greatest impact on the organization, either providing value or providing revenue. All right. Yeah, Paul, let me, let, me, let me jump in real quick on that. Yeah. Um, what, what I find is after the first three programs, the group gets into a rhythm. Mm -hmm. And so it typically takes less than 20 minutes for, for many of the programs. Once you start thinking about, and, and we'll go through that in just a little bit, what that process is. So that 20 minutes is an average that, that can be flexible. So, so some of that is an assessment, while you, an, an assessment of the, the facilitated process um, while you're in the, the heat of it, trying to figure out what you can do. Um, interestingly, I, I had a, a client who did assess all of their awards. And <laughs> what happened was, and this was fascinating, this is why part of that, that conversation that we'll talk about a little bit is so important um, after, after we make the objective assessment. Because what happened was they turned their awards from a one winner award into a quasi, not really a certification, but something that anybody could attain. And so they, they set a higher bar and they started transitioning how their awards program could actually help the industry achieve a different goal, which was a higher public standard, which was really a fascinating conversation that came from just that look at awards, because we were going to toss that out too. But then it actually became one of the most important uh, changes that they made to a program and consolidate a, a whole bunch of things around it. Really fascinating part of the discussion. All right. Sorry. So we are getting several questions lined up. I want to let Carolyn move on and move us on into the step two part of this whole show, because uh, then we can answer these questions a little bit further down, but we got to get further into it, right? Yeah, so, let's do it. Let's go. Carolyn. All right, thank you, Kiki. Just put us on mute when you need to. <laughs> so once you've identified those programs to assess, 
The next step is to really to prepare background information. And this is a very, very critical piece because it's that background information that's gonna be used when you actually do the, do the assessment. So some of the considerations to think about is, you know, really providing the most current and accurate information about that program. And I know sometimes um, if there's a pet project or a program that you've had for a long time, it's easy not to maybe be as specific or as accurate as you want to be, but it needs to really be very objective. And so again, that goes into avoid the selling. You wanna be really just state the program where it is and what's going on with it. And we'll walk through what those factors are in just a minute. And then it's really important to calculate your um, staff time. You know, many times we don't think about how much staff time is being spent on a program. You know, maybe it's someone's part of a job, but you don't realize that if you were to calculate their weekly or monthly time spent, it really starts to add up. So it is important to calculate that staff time as a percentage of um, a full-time equivalent position. And then lastly, if you're going to do this virtually, we're just recommending that maybe maximum of two slides per program prepared in advance. Again, that is just a a recommendation and it's going to vary and I was just going to add to what Jim and Paul said that the groups that I've worked with it, it has ranged in assessing 12 up to maybe 30 programs and a lot of it depends on if you're bringing your volunteer leadership in which we highly recommend that sometimes it, it comes down to if you have to prioritize and you really want to get their input you have to think about how many programs you can realistically conduct or do in a, in a specified period of time. So as we look at, at, at what goes into that program background worksheet, which is so important, first of all, you're gonna have a description about the program. What is the program that your organization offers? Secondly, what is its alignment to the strategic plan? Specifically, what are the goals and objectives within the strategic plan that this program supports? We, we are strong believers in that the programs and services that you're offering should align with your strategic plan. Another one is the whole usage market penetration. And this relates to the primary and secondary target audiences that are, are being um, impacted by this program. Do you know what those, who those audiences are and what is the market penetration percentage? Do you have that data? And how is this program being valued by members? You know, if you have data, if you have survey data, anything to support how that program is being used, how often it's being used, et cetera, that can all go into this kind of information. Next is competition. Are there internal and external competitive programs that provide similar benefits to your members or to other customers, even though the programs may be designed differently? It's really important to look at your, your competition, not just externally, but also internally. And if you're making this assessment based on um, the program, do you think your program is how you compare it to competitors? Is it better? Is it the same or is it worse? So again, looking at that competitive landscape is really important. Next is the financial picture. And again, what is the program's financial strategy for, and is it meeting its financial strategy? It's important to look at, does this program really generate revenue over expenses? Is it a break even? Is it, um, or is it a loss? Is it subsidized by other programs? And um, it's important again, to maybe do like a three year outlook on how has that program fared over the past three years? And then what percentage of this organization's total expense and revenue does this program represent? And it's important to include direct expenses as well as indirect expenses. And then going forward, do you expect that this program is going to increase, decrease, or stay the same over the, over the next uh, year or so? And then lastly, just what is, the, what is the future opportunities for this program? Do you see that this program has been around for a while and it's just not going to continue? Or do you really see um, that, it's, that it should grow, that you maybe need to reposition it, but it's going to grow? And secondly, what are some of the challenges that have maybe you've never considered about this program that really need to be looked at and assessed going forward? So those are some of the uh, factors that go into a program back worksheet. So we had a, a question asking for clarification around staff time. And Michael asks, when you say staff time, do you mean hours or dollars, maybe both? I think I was preferring to staff time hours, but I think it also does, you know, if you're finding that a program is consuming, you know, 10% or 20% of a person's time, you then calculate what is that in salary? And is that, is that program really being justified by the investment of that staff person's time. So I think you could look at it both ways. 
All right. Yeah. And Rosa yeah. has a, oh, did somebody have something else? Well, I was just going to say that this is, this is so important here because so many times, and I was just with a group when we were going through this, that this was the biggest issue for them is that they, the staff were identifying that these programs were making lots of revenue, the ones that were working on it, but they weren't allocating their time to it. And all of a right. sudden, when we started allocating that time, all of a sudden the program went from, you know, making revenue for the organization to being a big loss. So this is really important. Now, how you do it, whether it's, you know, money or time, obviously the money needs to be identified as time, but you gotta, you gotta look at those both direct and indirect expenses. All right. Yeah, uh, both, both are best. If you can do time and you can do um, actual money, that's, yeah. that's best. Those two dimensions are, are best. If, if a lot of it's dependent on the, the association's ability to track that also. Yeah. Rosa had a question, what if a program is considered essential to the mission of the association, but it's not financially profitable? So for example, Soul book sales. The organization. Yeah, so um, that's the nature of an association, you know, is that we can do those things. You know, we, that's that whole idea of where money comes in and where money is allocated. I mean, I don't know out there, I'd love to know who, how, how many of you are making money off of your advocacy efforts. It's a big black hole. You know, but yet, um, but yet, so that's one of the values of an association. Now we know that all of our programs can't be subsidized. So it's really helping us, this whole program assessment, and you'll see by the cells we put it in, it's all based on the, the need to look at the whole picture. Because if you have too many that aren't making you money, you're in trouble. But if all your programs are just making money and you just look like a business and you don't look like a value-based organization, you're in trouble as well. So it's really finding that right balance that's important. All right, we have one more question. Uh, it's from a person we all know and love. Uh, Glenn asks, aren't there some core programs that are safe from harm? Is it useful to exclude them from the assessment if you can't do all of them? Maybe return to them later to use the criteria to see if they can be improved. Yeah, I mean, at this point, you know, because we're talking about this program at a very interesting time in our history as organizations, I would focus on those that, you know, either cr will create the greatest revenue for in the future or require the most reinvention in the future or should be get eliminated. So I would ignore those that, you know, you don't typically, you know, you're not going to do a whole lot with right now. However, the idea of this is to really look at the whole portfolio and to see the right balance. So I do encourage those programs to be assessed in the future, but probably not right now. All right. Yeah, I, I, I find it extremely helpful to, to include those because it's a base of comparison with other programs. And also it forces an association to not just put it on the shelf and think we can continue to do that the way we've always done it. It forces you to think about how it might be different. How's the audience changed? What, what's the impact? What are the implications? How is the, the staffing trade-off with other programs and services? So including that at some point is extremely important. Otherwise, you may have a big chunk of staff time and resources uh, that may be going to something that, that uh, becomes its own little uh, black hole or continues to be a black hole. Really yeah. important part of it. Good point. All right, so let's let's go ahead. If there are any questions, we'll, we'll reach out and talk now, about those to the next break or at the next now, break. Now we get to the actual assessment part that we've been yeah, talking let's about. Do we've it. identified the programs. Uh, that we're going to take a look at, and we've got the background material that helps us, that reinforces that that make uh, that foundation that we make decisions based on knowledge and not on assumptions. Um, and then we actually have the the, the in-person uh, assessment and the process, the flowchart that you see here outlines that that assessment that we'll talk about, where we present and discuss the background. We see, make sure that everybody understands the information that's being provided. This is usually sent out ahead of time. Um, as in, in my experience, so that folks come with questions. So there's clarity on, on what that foundation of knowledge is. Um, that's the, the Q&A part. And then we do a, a program assessment worksheet. We actually um, have some, some questions that, that people are asked to go through and assess based on those two dimensions that we talked about, attractiveness and competitive position. Whether, uh, whether the program is highly attractive or whether there's low attractiveness or whether there's a, we're in a strong or a weak uh, competitive position. We do that individually. And then, and then from that, we aggregate the answers and identify where the program fits with some cells that we talked about. What's the, what's the generic strategy that, that 
the answers to the questions present to us, which then forces a really interesting conversation. And this is oftentimes the most important part. It, it forces us to think about how the program, why it's in a particular cell, why it may need to grow, why is this saying we should divest from doing this anymore? Um, how does this fit with other programs also? And finally, we create actions in response to that cell placement and in response to those discussions. As we've learned in the last uh, uh, months in particular, while it's best to do this in person, um, it, we're able to do this virtually. And it's, it's best to do it in person because some of those conversations about programs are really hard to have if you're not looking someone in the eye. And, and really, especially when you're uh, discussing the future of uh, some pretty, pretty significant programs to your members and to your association. Uh, what you see here are some of those requirements which we all have of, of virtual meetings right now. The one in particular that, that is unique to this is the ability to, to poll participants. When we go through that worksheet, that assessment worksheet, when we ask people to evaluate um, high, low, strong, weak um, in the worksheet, it's important for us to have a tool that allows us to do that uh, live and in person. And, and I've used Zoom to do it, had one group that was using Survey Monkey to do it also. There are a lot of tools, but that's something that's, that's extremely important. The worksheet um, has a, a number of, of different components for us to, to assess those two dimensions. That first is program attractiveness. We, uh, we ask whether the, uh, there's a high, uh, a large size of a, a customer, break, customer base. Um, how is it aligned to the mission and strategic direction of the organization? An absolutely critical component to the attractiveness of a, of a program. Are we spending our resources helping us achieve the vision that we set that's defined also by the mission? Um, is there revenue enhancement? Is that important to us? Those are all, and, and many of those attractiveness um, components are an internal assessment also. And then the competitive position, we think of whether, as, as, as Paul, as we've all talked about, whether we are in a strong or a weak position to be competitive or to present this program? Does it contribute to our brand identity? Uh, is it the most effective utilization of resources? Um, how, is, how does this compare to, to other competitors? Are we in a strong position to present this uh, because of our brand? These questions get to this, these kinds of answers that then help us place the, the, uh, the program into uh, some of the boxes that Paul will talk about in a little bit. But this assessment is done individually, and then we come back and aggregate it into the, the, next, uh, the next slide, Paul, with the, uh, the um, analysis and the results. So, so just um, real quick, I'm just gonna jump in real quick and, and yeah. talk about this for a second, this worksheet. Um, one of the, we've got a, a full worksheet with a whole lot of questions that fall into these different uh, categories. And what we find is depending on why the association is doing this, you know, are we just doing this because we need more money and we need to figure out um, how we're gonna look at our financial strategy going forward? Or are we doing this primarily as a way to help align our portfolio with our strategic plan? Depending on why you're doing the assessment, some of these uh, areas may be weighted differently. So we have this list of, of, of areas that we look at and we also have a list or a series of questions you use to assess the, the strength or the weakness within each of these categories. And one of the things that's really important here is that we wanna be careful that we're just not making decisions around our programs based on revenue, for example, or just based on our strategic plan or just based on its value, because we know that some programs will be attractive because they bring in revenue, while other programs, like the question was asking, is attractive because it's more closer to our mission. So there's different ways a program can be attractive. And depending on why it's attractive, it changes our strategy that we would use going forward. So this is really important to make sure it's very customized to whatever goals or objectives you got as an association. Yeah, and, and there's a, a continuous debate to how many questions and, and whether you use um, four or, or, uh, or six um, uh, answers in the Likert scale or, or how you do this. But the important thing is that you have, as Paul said, the right questions. Um, you're 
you're creating that 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 forced look at the 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 program also as a result of the questions so that when we look at the results when we aggregate the results of the individual assessments in the worksheet we can then determine whether the group thinks based on the information that they've had and and the questions and answers they're in a high or low um, uh, uh, attractiveness whether this program is is attractive to the organization or whether it's not and whether the pro whether the organization is in a strong or a weak competitive position to execute on the program itself based on those answers those aggregated answers the programs are placed into generic cells, which then results in a conversation about why that program is placed into a particular generic cell. And uh, the result of that then is a discussion that allows us to think about, to generate some key insights, to think about the implications of that cell for an organization, whether it's uh, build up or sell out, do we make a strong investment in this program and set some very defined markers, some very defined metrics that, that allow us to determine when perhaps we might divest ourselves from the program, or what does, what does it mean to, um, to combine the program with somebody else? What does it mean to, to, to then look for a partner with this? Or uh, what, what, what does it mean? What would it take to grow the program? So those discussions then become extremely important so that we understand and can develop some actions in response to those strategies. And so, the following grid that, uh, that Paul will go into a little bit more talks about uh, how to place those programs and then what to do with that. Yeah, one more thing before, before we go on to the grid, I just wanted to um, also, one of the questions we typically get when we're, when we're going through this program with assessment process with people is can you use this assessment process for new programs, for programs that don't exist? Mm -hmm. Now, typically we're using this primarily for your current portfolio. And then from that, we identify the gaps where you could potentially um, I, you know, create new programs. However, um, using this worksheet that we just talked about before, by modifying it a bit, you can use it for new programs. So if a committee comes up with a new program, this worksheet and or the worksheet that's behind these areas here is a really good worksheet to use if you modify it a bit for uh, new programs as well. Yeah, the, the whole process can be, can be modified. For that and and it takes a little bit of thinking differently about it because you're not looking at history you're anticipating what might happen in the future with it but you're doing the same kind of objective analysis of audience and competition and what kind of investment would it take that you need to go through with new product development also and the advantage frankly when i've worked with with associations who have gone through this for new for for existing and new new programs the advantage is then you have a consistent measure you have a yeah. consistent tool by which you're measuring programs, developing um, um, some, some ways to evaluate them in the future also. And an interesting result that came out of, of one group was they were investing in a new program and went through this and realized that it was, they were going to be competing with themselves. Mm. And so they, um, they actually started merging the two programs together and hadn't realized it until they actually had this conversation because there were two different groups of staff and two different volunteer groups who were developing these different programs. And not until they were forced to look at things combined did they realize that they were putting a lot of money investing in a new program that was going to be competing. So we've been talking, uh, uh, Jim has mentioned this whole idea of cells. And you know, um, you've, gone, you've, you've done the background, You've now gotten together either virtually or face-to-face. -face. You've all assessed the program. And if you're doing it virtually, you, you voted electronically. If you're doing it face-to-face, -face, you may not vote electronically. You vote on a flip, flip chart or whatever. And then by everybody voting together, you come up with one uh, cell, strategic cell. And we've condensed uh, the, the number of cells that used to exist in this program from, I think, eight down to four, because we find that today, this is really the four quadrants or four cells that are probably the ones that most organizations are thinking about today. And I'll go quickly through the, the four cells, but to let you know, 
that um, there's more descriptions later on in the PowerPoint that I'll just briefly go through as well. But so I'll just give you some quick definitions here. What we mean by build strength or sell out, this is a program that is not doing really well. So competitive position is weak, but it is, it is highly attractive. In other words, there's interest out there. There's a possibility for making more money. And this would be the cell that we would call sort of the reinvention cell, where you know, if you've got programs, for example, today that you're doing face-to-face -face and you need to reinvent those to be more hybrid or virtual, this is the opportunity, build strength or sell out. Now, what's important about this cell though, is that it's not just about building it up or reinventing it. It's also about assessing whether it still is attractive after you reinvent. So that's the concept of sell out. So we don't just want to commit to spending more resources on it. We want to commit to spending possibly more resources on it, but also then making a decision whether those resources make a difference or not. So sometimes we put resources into a program and we just keep throwing, throwing resources into it and we don't set a date of how we're going to assess if actually that reinvention really worked. So build strength or sell out is this sort of sell that says, let's put money into it with the understanding that we're not sure if that investment is going to pay off and we're going to get rid of it if it doesn't. Obviously, the, the lower sell underneath that uh, is the divestment sell. This is where it's, you're, you're not doing it really well, you're competitively weak, and it's also not very attractive. And there are two subsets within divestment, which is get rid of it right away. You have no business being involved in this, or maybe you need to divest of it over time. In other words, you've got contracts in place that you can't get rid of immediately, but the idea would be is that you're moving towards divestment. Then we have the, the right-hand side high, high sell, which is aggressive growth, which is this is highly attractive. We're in a strong position. And this actually, if we put more resources into it or time, probably could do better than what it is doing today. So it's not only looking at where things are currently, but where things could go in the future. So that's aggressive growth. And then this last sell in the other corner is what we call sort of calculated growth. And this is where you've got programs that you don't believe you need to get rid of. You don't believe you should invest more in because they don't have much more potential. You don't believe they could grow anymore, but you got to do them. So that's this idea of calculated growth. Now, we just didn't say keep the way it is because every program you should always look at. You should be always looking at ways to improve it. But that's why we're using this term sort of calculated growth versus, you know, keep it the way it is. Because we do want you to consider programs that, that could grow even though they may not, they may have low attractiveness. So once you take all of those programs, put it through the process, identify a cell, identify um, your key strategies of what you're gonna do with that program, then it's also important to then map all of the programs on a grid. Because what you're looking for here is you're looking for where, where, there's, um, where there's balance and where there isn't balance. You know, do you have too many programs that you're build strengthening and, and going to sell out in. Because if you have too many programs you're supposed to be divesting money in, that may be too much. So this is where you may adjust your program portfolio based on the strength of any of these programs and make further decisions once you see it all on a grid. So we do recommend that not only you look at each individual program, but then you put all of the portfolio on a grid to look at the whole thing. And then these two um, uh, next slides are just definitions of the three of the four cells, just to get a sense of sort of what we mean by those four cells. So well, then, once have, you, oh, oh, sorry, go ahead. go ahead. I was just going to say uh, we have an interesting question over here that talks about internal competitive advantage. Um, Michael says, talk more about internal competitive advantage, in particular the nature of programmatic competition in associations with federated state or regional entities. So what about these programs where they're almost competing with themselves? So is that within the, the national organization or within the whole organization of chapters? And because, you know, if do you, do you have a sense of is it is it when you look at the whole picture of an organization and a federation or just a national organization? Uh, it, it says with federated state or regional entities. Ah, so. Okay. So, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So I have used this actually to help organizations uh, determine the, where the program should lie, whether the program okay. should lie within their chapters 
or whether the program should lie within the national. And, and this is, that's a really interesting uh, element to this that you can do by tweaking the questions a bit because it helps you to kind of then determine, is this something we should be doing or is this something our state and local chapter should be doing? Really, mm -hmm. really interesting uh, element to this. There's also a I've question had, about- I've had, that go, I've had okay. that go both ways where state and local chapters are doing things that they shouldn't be doing, that, that they're not best positioned to do also. And it's huh. forced the, the national or the larger umbrella organization to, to, uh, to think differently about how it approaches programs. I really love this question, you know, because it does bring up uh, one of those elements of, of having an association that makes associations so unique where it's who should really be doing this right now and, and is this the best for the overall organization. So excellent question, Mar uh, Michael. We also have Anonymous asks a question about polling. Have you ever used paired comparison voting or forced ranking? Yeah, a couple of things I would say on that. One is that um, in the past, the forced ranking or comparison has been done through a conversation, so more qualitative, because we weren't using an electronic voting system, we were using more of a conversation. Now, the wonderful thing about doing this virtually and potentially using some of the polling tools that are out there is yes, you can do a little bit more where you can weight things differently, and you can also do forced comparison. So yes, the wonderful thing about doing this virtually is that you can use some of those tools. And now we're also adapting those tools to doing it face-to-face -face as well because they're, do they're working so well. I had, a, I had an interesting, uh, a client who's, who almost all of their programs ended up in build, stre build strength or sell out. And we forced them to do uh, rank choice voting on all the programs to see, to, to evaluate which ones they were gonna invest in because they could not do all of them. Yeah. Um, so it was an interesting application of that. I bet. At, at, a, at a good time in the process too, to really think about <laughs> what is it that we really want to do? What programs do we really want to invest in? Mm -hmm. uh, Michael is requesting if we could just go back a slide and show the definitions for cells one and two a little bit longer so that uh, people can take those in. All right. Thank Carolyn, you. you wanted to jump in? Yeah, Carolyn, go ahead. Jump in and say, I think that between this force ranking and weighted ranking, I know I recently worked with, a, it was an engineering society, and the CEO specifically said, we're not going to get into debating whether this, you know, uh, outcome should have been a 3.2 or a 3.7. So <laughs> to a, a forced ranking, which again, you have to know your membership, you have to know kind of their mindset for determining what kind of scale you want to be using so you can really get to some productive outcomes. Hmm. Yeah, and, and if a group is really into, you know, just doing this more scientifically, you know, you may want to recommend not doing it that way because then that allows for that more qualitative conversation, which is sometimes valuable for people who just feel like they have to have a number to make a decision. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you don't want to get, you don't want to necessarily get stuck on the number because you want to have that conversation about what does this look like in the future? not mm -hmm. where we think it is today. What do you okay. think are some of the, I, I know we're getting ready to go into creating the report, but I just wanna ask at this point, I, I always like to ask questions about at this stage in the game, when you are getting to the point where um, you're making these decisions and you're looking at the numbers that are coming back and, and having these discussions, where can things go off the rails? You know, is there, what do you usually see where um, you have to sort of rein things in with clients at this point? It's, it's when, it's when clients during the discussions, they take a look at that grid mm -hmm. and they decide or they start, start moving things around that are based on how they feel and not right. the objective discussion that they went through. And that's where, frankly, that, that's where I end up jumping in and saying, no, you, you can't do that because now you're using subjective measures again. You're, you're, you're doing it based on feeling. You're doing it based on uh, what volunteers are going to upset or what staff are in the room that you might upset rather than saying, how does this need to look different in the future? Mm -hmm. um, it's important to get leadership and get folks who will be making decisions based on this invested in this process also so that when, it come, when they see the report that Paul's going to go through, they, they have agreed to this process and they know what they're getting 
uh, later on so that they, it makes it more difficult for them to, to alter those decisions. But those are points where I've seen it start to, the, the wheels start to shake a little bit in the, <laughs> uh, in the process. And All right. Kiki, I was just going to add that I think sometimes if, a, if an organization really has never gone through this process or it's been many years and you have different leadership, there's a lot of aha moments that they don't really realize that there are members, you know, volunteer leaders and staff that maybe have strong feelings about certain aspects of a program that have never been really uncovered or thought through or discussed. So I think sometimes you really get a program out on the table and for its transparency and to really evaluate sort of its strengths and weaknesses overall. Yeah, I, I can imagine that this is where it really is where these emotional and, and like the anecdotal, the stories, we've always had this. It's part of the fabric of who we are as an association. I'm sure that a lot of that comes out at this point. So 20 years ago, this program was great. <laughs> and, it was anyway. yeah. Yeah. and you never want to put somebody's name on a program because you'll no. never be able to get rid of that. You know, exactly. you know, you get somebody's name on a program. Mm. Okay. Is everybody listening to this? These, yeah. This is gold. You need to take, <laughs> yeah. okay. But, but also some other lessons learned with that too is um, I found that really being sort of firm up front with some guiding, some ground rules, yeah. because I've also had experiences where staff, you know, have, you know, this is my program. Don't, you know, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to defend this program to the death because this is my program. And, yeah. you know, staff has to be careful as well to be objective. So one of the strategies that a couple of uh, times I've done this with clients recently have done is when, when originally you're presenting the program to the group for assessment, typically have a, a staff member do it who isn't responsible for that program. So, mm -hmm. so therefore they don't have that sort of edge of trying to defend it or trying to advocate for getting rid of it. So, you know, it's on both sides. You really want to get, you know, really want to be as objective as you possibly can. And we do recommend that the group that does this, it's a small group that actually does the assessment and it should be made up of both staff and volunteers. Mm -hmm. And the volunteers that should be involved are volunteers that actually have influence in the final outcome. In other words, you know, don't throw it to a committee that's gonna to have to bring it to the board and that committee doesn't have any clout. You get mm -hmm. board members involved, you get the, you know, you get the, the president elect involved who's gonna to have to take this and, and make and announce the hard decisions. You get those leaders involved as well as senior staff that will have to be involved in, in the final decisions on the staffing side. So it really is important to get that, that team involved. We have about eight minutes left. So I just want to give a shout out to another anonymous uh, uh, comment that says, try to cut a program and you'll find out who started it. And that is definitely <laughs> true. Yeah. yeah. And then, uh, and then there is a request of, uh, for a couple of examples of the kinds of questions that are on the worksheets, maybe one or two or attractiveness and, and one or two for competitive positions, something like that. So if we have time to include that uh, before the end, you know, we might want to address that question as well. Okay, yeah, Carolyn, we you've got the last couple of slides. So yeah. let's uh, go ahead and close Great. it up. And I'll just highlight these because for the step four, and again, every step is important in this process, but we sort of already talked about what are the elements that once you've assessed the program that um, you're gonna analyze and come up with. So in your reporting, we think it's important to obviously create a report. You think about the time that staff have invested, that volunteer leaders have invested. And so it is important to really document those findings. And so these are just the elements that we would um, suggest that you include in the report. You know, the program that you evaluated, what was the cell, et cetera, and um, just recommended actions in the next steps. So moving on to step five was really presenting those recommendations. It's really important that if you have key stakeholders that have been involved in this process, that maybe they're the ones that really present those recommendations. Um, we have found that when it's the, it's the, st it's the uh, volunteer that they can um, maybe in addition or working with staff, it can be a good combination for really presenting those recommendations. But it's really important to communicate that politically sensitive. If it's a program that's really been around for a long time, then maybe you need to have some side conversations or an advanced conversation just to say, you know, we evaluated this program. It seems like, you know, it's maybe lived out its course. And this is something that we're going to be communicating just so no one is caught off guard. And then we really recommend a vote. Again, this is not just a process or an exercise that, that the organization went through just because it was something fun to do, but that there are really, there's a vote on the recommendations that were made um, 
that were tied to each of the programs going forward so that, that it is documented for the organization and for future leaders to say, no, we discussed this, we went through a, a proper assessment, and this is the vote that was made on it. And the last step is really implementing um, the strategies. And again, just working, you know, whether it's committees or other work groups to really implement whatever the decisions came out of with those key insights and uh, those next steps and recommended actions. Those are the groups that, that need to be informed about, are we going to be growing a program? Are we going to be sunsetting a program? What is the time frame for that, um, for, for that to happen? You know, is it going to occur in this budget cycle or next budget cycle? Again, what are the ramifications if you have had a program um, that, has, uh, that, that has not made much money and you want to grow it, does more monies need to be put in the budget? Again, thinking through that, those ramifications. Again, continue to communicate. I can't overemphasize any kind of politically sensitive programs that have been around for a long time, especially if you're gonna be sunsetting them, it's really important to have those crucial conversations. And then just including feedback and progress reports. It's, in, it's important that everyone is kept informed on the progress going forward of what is happening with that strategy. Again, communication, communication is so important when you implement these strategies. So I think I'll turn yeah, it back to uh, building, Kiki. Building that, building that structure that, that forces you to take a look at it six months or a year out is absolutely, just like strategic planning, how do you evaluate progress? Mm -hmm. if, if it sits on a shelf and it's a one-time activity, then usually nothing happens. But if you continue to have it in front of folks and you have that process established that Carolyn just outlined and you have ways of looking at it and measuring, measuring progress toward it, then something productive can happen. Yeah, and, and you know, just in our experience the last several months, you know, this is the time to do this. You know, um, I've done this in the past when associations had more money than they have today. And it was easy not to make the hard decisions because, eh, we got reserves. Why do we have to get rid of something that's politically charged? Let's just keep it. But now is the time to do this. Now is the time to really clean up your portfolio and really focus on those things that are that create the greatest value, not only to the members, but to the organization and get rid of that stuff that doesn't and reinvent those things that, um, that really will make a difference going forward. So, you know, this is the time to do this. Now, I know that we had a couple questions, Kiki, one around what are the questions kind of behind this worksheet? It was so, a question about questions. Yes. Yeah, right, right. So <laughs> anybody want to take a stab at that or I can if Jim. Yeah, I, so I some of the some the of the questions around around attractiveness um, is it central to our mission? Does it help us achieve our vision? Um, does it provide value to our our current or potential members? Um, around the the customer base, is it a sufficient customer base? So it's 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 getting to um, questions that relate to how it helps us achieve what we're committed to doing as an organization. And is it, is it being utilized by our, our audience, our members? Um, when it comes to competitive position, um, does the program help our, our brand strategy and marketing position? Does it effectively, effectively and efficiently utilize the resources of staff, uh, the resources of volunteer members? Um, are we able to, to deploy the finances uh, more competitively or more effectively perhaps than others? Um, or do we have the right kind of marketing and communications uh, strategy around it? So are, are we in a position to invest more in the program also? So those are some of the questions that come around the, the competitive position. And as you can hear, there, there, there's, there's a large number that could be utilized based upon the unique dynamics of, of any association. So um, it's, it's, um, it's hard to put up, put up an actual sheet up because it's a little bit different for every group. And, and it, it, we have to make sure that we have the right question and we're asking the right questions because it's so important to, to force that next conversation that we no. talked about when it goes to the evaluation of the cells. Yeah, and, and also too, just to kind of, if you're saying, well, I don't know if we can answer those questions. Well, that's what the background material is for. So yes. all those questions that Jim just outlined, you've got background information that you've collected to help the group make truly information rich decisions rather than just their opinions. Uh, and, if, oh, go ahead. <laughs> and what we, what, what we tend to do is, is um, you know, when we begin this process is to think about 
what kind of background is necessary? What are those questions we need to ask? What are the critical evaluations? And so that's part of that, that initial setup for the whole process so that we are um, getting everything lined up to, to do this effectively. Information rich, information yes. based decision making. We are yes. so excited. Knowledge based decision making. <laughs> That's what we're all about. That's what we're all about. Even in these times. Even in these times. Especially. Gotta be careful. Especially. That you're just not reacting. Times. Look at this crowd, you guys. You know, how am I supposed to bring them back to Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for joining us for today's session. Look, today's session has been recorded and you're all going to receive an email with a link to the replay. I also had a question about slides earlier. Rest assured, you will receive a PDF of the slides. We're very excited to share this with you. We're excited for you to share this with your teams. And if you have any questions, please reach out to us. We want to hear from you. If you got value from today's session, let us know, share it with a friend. That's the best thing you can do. And until next time, everyone, uh, please be safe and healthy. We've got another session that's coming up in a couple of weeks. It's going to be a great topic on critical decisions and you want to know more about that. So we'll send the link to you. We'll talk to you soon. Talk to you next time. Bye everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thanks everyone. <laughs>